in this video, I'm going to talk about how Jesus' second return will take place. Will the world see Jesus again? When Jesus came on the worldly scene more than 2,000 years ago, he was dispatched into the world of mankind by his father as a man. He left the heavenly realm, not as a man, but as an angel. And he became a man through being born of a woman, Mary. So his insertion into the world more than 2000 years ago was that of a savior of the world, not as a king. That will be later. And plus, his insertion or his coming the first time was a visible event. Now, Jesus had his ministry of about 33 years. He died and then he ascended. Where did he go? Well, we know he spent three days in the grave. Then when he was resurrected by his father, he spent some 50 days appear before his disciples. Remember Doubting Thomas? Then he ascended. And when he ascended, did he ascend back into the place to, from where he came as a man? No. He was transformed and he returned back into the invisible spiritual realm in the very same form he had before he was dispatched out of heaven the first time he came. So at present, the one that the world knows as Jesus Christ, the Hamashiach, the Messiah, is an invisible spirit being like the other sons of God. He's an angel. If we read from the book of Acts, and I'll put that scripture here for you to read and research this for yourself. There are men of Galilee looking up as he's ascending. And he's ascending on a cloud and he just vanished from their sight. He vanished from that sight, he went invisible. Men of Galilee, why do you strip in the sky? Because this man that you saw ascend up into heaven will return in the same manner. Think about that. Jesus' second return will be like it was when he ascended. Number one, was his ascension witnessed by a lot of people? No, only a few people recognized or saw his ascension. And he ascended on a cloud or in a cloud, meaning invisibility, because he vanished from their sight. So his second return will be on a cloud or in a cloud, invisible. The world will not see him again. The world will not see Jesus when he returns. If one goes to Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, his disciples ask him a question. What would be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. You see, his disciples didn't ask him, when will we see you again? They knew they wouldn't see him again. So they asked him for the sign, not signs, the sign. Jesus goes on to talk about many things. Nation rises against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes. But Jesus says, these are the beginning of birth pains. The end is not yet. And Jesus talks about many other things. But when one drops down to Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, then Jesus answers the question they ask up there at verse three. What would be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? At Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, Jesus says to them, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear. Where? On earth? No, it will appear in heaven. So no one on earth will see that sign. That sign will only be witnessed and seen by those who live or reside in heaven. And who resides in heaven? All of the other angelic hosts or sons of God. And of course, God himself. Many today have no clue as to what that sign is. Jesus gave us clues. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 through 8. Because he mentions the end is not yet, and these are the beginning of birth pains. Who has birth pains? A woman 
who's about to give birth. If one goes to Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we see that sign, the sign mentioned again. A woman appears in heaven. That's exactly what Jesus said at Matthew chapter 24, verse 30, that the sign will be seen in heaven. So there's a woman who appears in heaven. This is not a literal woman because literal women don't live in heaven. Human beings don't live in heaven. We live on earth. We came from the earth. But also in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we're told that that woman is pregnant. Is that not what Jesus said there at Matthew chapter 24, verse 6 through 8? That these are the beginning of birth pains? So that sign is associated with that woman. So what is the sign that will be seen in heaven? A woman who's pregnant. Who is this woman in Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 and 2? It's God's kingdom. God's kingdom is pregnant. It is about to give birth to a 1,000 year kingdom of Christ over the earth. And those who reside in heaven will be the only ones who will see that. We, we can't look into that invisible heavenly realm. So when it occurs, it's going to occur out of our eyesight and out of our earshot. So it will be invisible to us. So Christ's second return will be as a thief in the night, invisible. So it's coming like I just mentioned there in, in that scenario there in Acts, that his return will be in the same manner in, in which he ascended. Only a few recognized or witnessed the ascension and his ascension was invisible. So his return likewise will also be invisible. However, his second return will be unexpected. At Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said that he didn't know when his return would take place. Even the angels don't know that. That is privy only to the Father. Such knowledge is only in the jurisdiction of the Father. Then Jesus says at Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, therefore keep on the watch. Stay awake. Why? Because you do not know when your Lord is going to return. It's going to be unexpected. There aren't any signs that any of us are going to see on the earth. I've seen innumerable videos on YouTube and I've listened to many sermons where many are outlining the things Jesus mentioned after Matthew chapter 24 verse 3 about nation rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom and earthquakes and all that as being signs. No, those are not signs. There will only be the sign and the sign will not be witnessed by anyone here on earth. So if you see videos where individuals are saying that, that these are the signs of Jesus' return, be careful because it would not be signs, but it would be the sign that will signal that the Father has given his son his promised kingdom of a thousand years over the earth. Christ will not return to the earth. His second coming, his second return will not be as a savior, but as a king. A king doesn't have to be present to rule over his kingdom. Christ will rule over his kingdom, that is the earth, from the heavenly realm. All of the kingdoms that we know of today will be gone when that occurs. Jesus is not going to share his kingdom with any of the existing kingdoms of the day in spite of how mighty and arrogant they are they will be destroyed. Daniel chapter two, verse 44. Christ's kingdom has an age. And that's what his disciples also ask him at Matthew chapter 24, verse three. See, they first ask him, what will be the sign of your coming? And of course, at verse 30, Jesus answered that question. And they also ask him, and what will be the end of the age? What age? The age of his kingdom. What is the age of Christ's kingdom to come? 1,000 years. Christ's yet future kingdom will run its course of 1,000 years and then it will end. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. 
When it ends, something very interesting happens. Satan the devil is released from his abyssing of a thousand years. It is interesting that Satan's abyssing is the exact same duration of Christ's 1,000 year kingdom. In other words, the devil will be taken out of the way when Christ's 1,000 year kingdom runs its course. So he will not be able to interfere with Christ's administration over the earth. Because during that 1,000 year kingdom of Christ, there'll be two resurrections. All of that will be resurrected. The earth itself will be restored to its original beauty and perfection. And we will be restored to our creator. When the 1,000 years of Christ ends, we will no longer need Christ because we'll be perfect. We'll be like Adam was. Did Adam have a Jesus Christ? Did Adam have a mediator between himself and his, his creator? No, it wasn't needed because he was perfect. That's how we're gonna be made, perfect. One to one with our creator, restored to our creator. So when the devil is released, from his abyssing of a thousand years, that is what he's going to see. He's gonna see a perfect human society. Christ is not there. His kingdom will have ended. We'll be on our own, perfect. No mediator. We'll be fresh meat for the devil again. Because at Revelation chapter 20, verse seven and eight, we're told he goes out to deceive the entire world again, Gog and Magog. And I've said this before. Many people have a problem with it. I don't. The contents of the book of Revelation, none of it has had a start of fulfillment. The start of the fulfillment of the contents of the book of Revelation occurs when Satan is released from his abyss of a thousand years. That's all still yet future. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1. A revelation from Jesus Christ that God gave him to do what? To show his servants what must shortly or soon take place. Shortly or soon take place after what? When Christ's 1,000 year kingdom ends and Satan's released from the abyss. That's when. So the revelation is a, a segue or a warning as to what is going to take place when Christ's yet future 1,000 year kingdom ends and Satan's released from his abyss of a thousand years. When Satan's released from his abyss of a thousand years, it's during that time that there will be a great tribulation, Armageddon, the establishment of the beast, 666, the false prophet, the beast that comes out of the earth, and of course the beast uh, mentioned at Revelation chapter 13 verse one, that has seven heads, 10 horns and 10 crowns upon each head. The scarlet colored beast that we read about in uh, Revelation chapter 17, it's a very, and that beast is the same beast as when mentioned at Revelation chapter 13, it's that we're seeing it at a different time. At Revelation chapter 13 verse one, this beast is powerful. At Revelation chapter 17, we see that very same beast, but it doesn't have any crowns. So it has lost its power, its kingly authority. Something else controls it, powers it. A woman who has the name Babylon the Great. All those things are yet future. It is impossible to squeeze the contents of the book of Revelation into our time period today. The glove does not fit. And I stand by that. And I'll continue uh, talking about this. There's so much that I haven't told you yet. And all one has to do is not rely upon their own understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Ask God, that's what I did, ask him. You can't rely upon churches, preachers, pastors, apostles. This is what they call themselves, right? You must rely upon God's intelligence, God's wisdom, God's understanding, his knowledge, his Holy Spirit. Else, you're not going to get it. So that's what I have for you guys today. There'll be more on this subject because it is very important. If you don't know where we stand in the stream of time and prophecy, you're going to be deceived. Something else, that war in heaven between 
Michael and his angels and the dragon and his angels that hasn't occurred yet that's also yet future so what does that mean that means that the devil has not been cast down out of heaven yet he still has full access into that heavenly realm he can come and go as he pleases God isn't forbidding him and also those that he will have recruited who will go to war with Michael and his angels in the future so this dragon is a very powerful angelic being and he is not a hideous looking creature as Christianity wants to portray him and paint him and like we see him in art film and literature he's not like that at all he's invisible anyway if you could see him his beauty is compared to precious stones this can be found in the book of Ezekiel and I'll leave that scripture below check it out for yourself don't be misled don't be deceived rely upon the father don't rely upon me I'm telling you where you must go go to the father approach him in prayer through the office of his son and the one that he commanded us to listen to Christ Jesus what's wrong with that why is it that Christianity and many Christians don't want you to rely upon the father they want you to rely upon what they say because they're making the assumption that God is speaking through them no God speaks through us and has spoken through us through his son so when I hear individuals say that God told them and showed them things I know that they're lying God has already spoken to us the problem is that many are not listening to that one Christ Jesus you cannot learn everything there is about God's son through a book men gave the name to Bible that's impossible because Jesus promised at his ascension before he ascended he told his disciples that he will send ask the father to send them a helper an advocate the Holy Spirit and that it would teach us we must rely upon that which is invisible God's Holy Spirit encompassed within that Holy Spirit is God's wisdom God's understanding God's knowledge God's discernment and much much more we must become spiritual persons Jesus said this much at John chapter 4 verse 24 that God is spirit and those who worship him must must worship him in spirit and truth can't worship God through a book that'd be idolatry would it not I am not saying that one isn't supposed to read the Bible you can read the book read it but God did not send us a book you must know that God sent us his son and he commanded us at Luke chapter 9 again the theme of this channel Luke chapter 9 verse 35 this is my son listen to him are you listening to Christ directly are you listening to Christ through the Holy Spirit or are you listening through religious organizations through a book if you are you missed the boat God wants you to rely upon him to trust him not other things Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father except by me or through me Christianity is saying you can't get to heaven for example unless you become a Christian so they're saying that they are the way plus Jesus never taught that anyone's going to heaven John chapter 3 verse 13 I have so much more to talk about so please stay tuned and don't forget please give this video a like help a brother out and subscribe because it helps the algorithm and they get the information out to many more to digest to research on their own because that's what I really encourage do your own research I'm not looking for agreement I don't want agreement from human beings I want individuals to examine things on their own so that they own it so others not telling them what to think you own that knowledge and the knowledge that you own you received it from the father just like in um, 
Matthew chapter 16, beginning at verse 15, Jesus with his disciples. And he asked them a question, who do you say I am? Peter answers, you're the son of the living God. Then Jesus says, blessed are you, Peter, for flesh and blood, flesh and blood, did not reveal that truth to you. But my Father in heaven did. So it is relies upon the Father that infuses us with power and discernment and knowledge and wisdom, but not our own. Be careful because flawed human beings cannot handle the truth all right. And if you follow them and if they fall into a pit, what do you think that you're going into a pit? In the sense that you possess the very same knowledge that, that they've given you. Now, if they have taught you a lie, now you possess the lie, believing that it's the truth. If he has given you the drug of emotion because he himself is spiritually addicted or drugged, then so will you be. Difficult to talk to, difficult to reason with, not even willing to examine Christ's teachings. If God says that his son is the son of God, there are those who are so spiritually drunk, they'll say, no, he isn't. Jesus is God. But wait a minute. God said that his son is the son of God, not God. His disciples, his closest companions, his apostles, said he's the son of God. So why are you teaching this made up Trinity thing? See, that's that spiritual drunkenness. And I've spoken about this. I'm going to speak more about it because it's getting really bad now. Many Christians cannot be reasoned with. And for those who cannot be reasoned with, you don't cast your pearls before the swine because they'll trample over it. They'll always look for loopholes to trip you up. See, that's evil in itself. Trying to trip persons up. That's evil. Emotionalism is a bad thing because it's like an addictive drug. So that's what I have for you guys today. This is R. Jerome Harris, the disciple. Thank you for listening.